Uh, just going to take you over now to East London, where the Work and Pensions Secretary, Amber Rudd, she's talking about health and disability, but she's taking questions from the media. Let's join now. Stories every day at the RNIB, as you'd expect. Um, we hear of, um, around the assessments, of a very challenging application process. We are being told that it's not very accessible and that there are multiple difficulties in wrong information, forms, inadequate training, etc. I hear that you're very keen to work through those issues and to, make, and to improve them. Um, will you commit to working with RNIB and other stakeholder organisations to, to input those changes at the beginning of a process so that when we have new processes that the, the accessibility is embedded in those processes? Um, such an interesting question and of course as you rightly say so, so relevant to me given my experience and in fact we were just talking earlier about accessibility for blind people to jobs and the need for the uh, process for application to be accessible and in some cases even though the companies themselves say they welcome applications from blind people the application form doesn't ask for a CV it asks them to complete an, an online application form that is not accessible so I think there's more we can do working with businesses um, on a sort of code basis or on a voluntary basis to get them to understand the barriers that they're putting up but of course, I want my department to be the exemplar in this. So I will make sure that we look again to ensure that our application forms for support are accessible as well. And I think I may be seeing you or somebody from your team tomorrow. You, tomorrow, you, Elliot. Fantastic. Now that is advocacy, isn't it? A question and a meeting all in one week. Thank you. I look forward to it. Question for me. I'm Richard Kramer, uh, CEO of Sense. Uh, we're here for everyone with complex disabilities and everyone who's deafblind. Um, one comment and a question. So the comment is that we should never forget that uh, disability benefits are a good thing because they enable people to live an independent life and meet the additional cost of disability, which I think you recognise. Um, my question is on, on, on employment um, and the, your more ambitious targets. Um, many people that we support really need more personalised and intensive support. And so how can you assure us that this group won't be left behind and that we also place equal premium on distance travelled, looking at active citizenship, volunteering, work placements, looking at different transitions as well as pure employment? Thank you. Well, there are lots of important points in that question. And I think the one about independence is the key, isn't it? It's about making sure that everybody has the independence to make their own choices. And also the point that Mark made in his introductory remarks about independence involves economic independence as well. You know, sometimes people say, why are you so focused on getting people into work? And it's partly because they then get the economic independence that people want as well. But I do agree with your point, is that we have to make sure that there are other forms of work as well. There's other forms of voluntary work that people can access. And actually, there's, there are some good pathways available. And I met some people here just, this, just earlier today who are taking advantage of that. Um, access to work is a really important part of the support that we give to people to make sure that they can do just that access work. And, um, I think that the maximum amount is capped at the moment at £57,000, but we spent £110 million on it in the past year. So I recognise the importance that it plays on making sure that people, as you rightly say, sometimes go long distances to access their work. I'm Guy from Scope. I manage our support to work service. Um, my team work on a daily basis with disabled people, so I know how voluntary employment support is really important but also know how difficult sanctions are for disabled people. So I wanted to ask if you'll look closely at Scope's own voluntary employment model as part of the no conditionality test you talked about earlier. Well, um, I'm glad you acknowledge the fact that we have proposed and we are trialling uh, a new system which I referred to in my speech where people who are, have disabilities start with no conditionality. And we will want to learn from that to see how well it works in terms of getting a right outcome and giving, I think the main thing is perhaps for the individual the confidence that the work coach is there to help them and support them. But I, I know you've done this work and I will certainly take a look at that as well and want to make sure that the outcomes that we finalise on are based on a combination of what we, we have been able to demonstrate and get some good feedback from you as well. Thank you. So shall I have some questions from over here, from Chris, who I may start with. Uh, quick, Chris Hope, Telegraph. Two quick questions, uh, Ms. Rudd. Um, you said there that some people feel like they've been put on trial by the, DUP, by the DWP. <laughs> DWP. That's an awkward slip. I'll rephrase that there. Yeah. The DWP. 
Um, do you think this has needlessly damaged the Tory party and how it's been, in, in the way that they're trying to save money has made it it's appear like the nasty party over benefits? And just secondly, quickly, the reports today that, that you've been gagged by, by number 10 and this could be sexist behaviour because of your stand on Brexit. Is this true? Well, I think that um, I can uh, contradict the second part of that sentence by my presence here, uh, speaking freely about the issue that matters most to me, which is uh, work and pensions in my agenda and in my subject area. Um, and on the first point, uh, what I'm acknowledging there is that it's an imperfect system to some people. And I think it's a mistake to look at the difficulties that are in the system at the moment and say, do you know before the Tories or before universal credit was perfect? It was far from perfect. You know, six different benefits, three different places, nowhere near the same personal engagement. It is imperfect at the moment. We can make huge improvements, which is what I'm starting to do. But do not think that we are replacing a perfect world. We are always improving, and I hope that as a government, we'll be able to continue to show that that's a really important part of our values, looking after the most vulnerable. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Tom Rayner from Sky News. Just to pick up on that point, um, you've acknowledged that universal credit has contributed to people going to food banks. You've just said that disabled people facing assessments feel like they are on trial. At what point do you think an apology might be necessary for the language that your party has perpetuated around benefit claimants being scroungers, skivers, the idea of a feckless poor? Do you think that there has to be an acknowledgement at some point uh, that that has contributed to these problems? And secondly, if I may, on Brexit, if uh, next week the Prime Minister's deal does not pass the, uh, the meaningful vote. If the government were to whip in favour of a no-deal Brexit, could you stay in Cabinet? Um, Tom, I, I don't recognise the first part of that question. The way you describe um, some language that has been used in the past is not the way the party operates at all. I think it should be reasonable for a Secretary of State to speak frankly about exceptions in the system and the exception that I referred to in the system was an exception about a disabled person feeling that they've been put on trial. But I can acknowledge that if that happens, I want everybody to have a better experience. I think it's disappointing if a Secretary of State has to come out and say 100% of what we do is perfect. I'm saying there are things we need to improve because we have made improvements and I'm going to continue to make sure that we do. Um, as far as the deal is concerned next, next week, I hope and believe that the deal will get through um, with help from all parties, potentially, and we will have to see what happens the day after if it doesn't. But I am planning for a successful Tuesday, making sure that we do get the deal because MPs, businesses, I think the whole country is mostly hoping that we can get the deal through and get on with the next stage. And people like myself and other Secretaries of State can put 100% of their time behind what really matters in their department, which for me is making sure that we help the most vulnerable. Yes. Hello, Dan Bloom from the Daily Mirror. Um, you, in order to uh, reform the work capability assessment, uh, you're having to extend the current contract by more than a year with Maximus. Uh, given what you said about tribunals and that, and that you're not happy with the number that get overturned, is it fair to the claimants and to the taxpayer to be handing you know, many millions more pounds uh, to this operator and to continue this contract as it is now for more than a year? And if I may, very quickly, um, the benefit freeze was sort of confirmed in its final form last night. Uh, do you regret that you weren't able to stop it for this coming year and can you guarantee that it will be stopped next year? Okay, so you will know that there are no plans... We are going to leave that. We'll keep an ear on that. If there are any more news lines come out of it, I, uh, we'll bring them to you. But uh, we're going to pull away from Amber Rudd there. The Work and Pension Secretary, Amber Rudd, has said that disabled pensioners will no longer face repeat assessments to continue receiving their benefits. From this spring, about 270,000 people will not have to have their personal independence payments regularly reviewed. But a disability group said the reform would still leave millions of younger people stuck in a failing system. Here's our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan. I've had trouble getting on and off transport buses and I can't get on the train at all. Uh, buses are difficult. 
so without the car I would be totally um, housebound. When Diane Barrett lost her car for six months following a benefit assessment, she says she lost her independence. The 69-year-old who lives with Parkinson's disease fought the decision and won. Today's government announcement means she won't now have any more reassessments for personal independence payments. Oh, it's a relief, yes, certainly, and it's great. I mean, it's wonderful that they're taking some notice and listens. Funny enough, I was only thinking about it the other day. I was thinking, oh, you know, the thought of going through that again, because you have a wadge of papers, and that, again, with Parkinson's, your writing's very bad, and the stress of it. We're not just talking about equality for people with physical disabilities. As well as specific help for pensioners with disabilities, Amber Rudd said she wanted to see more disabled people in work and to change her department's overall image. The benefit system should be the ally of disabled people. It should support them. People with disabilities and health conditions have enough challenges in life. Dealing with my department should not be one of them. The government is struggling to make the system work. Personal independence payments is 20% more expensive than the benefit it is replacing, and its rollout is five years behind schedule. Claimants are increasingly going to court to overturn negative decisions, and almost three quarters of them are winning their cases. The problem with PIP is the assessment process. People are called in for an assessment with a healthcare professional who doesn't know them, doesn't understand their condition and often they get scored zero points or very few points and the benefit is taken away from them. Diane Barrett may no longer need to go through an assessment process that she describes as deeply flawed. Despite today's relief for pensioners, around 1.8 million other people on the benefit will continue to struggle with a system that many campaigners say is broken. Michael Buchanan, BBC News. Well, with me is uh, Genevieve Edwards from the Emma Society. Genevieve, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Um, you were actually, you were just saying uh, at that uh, news conference that Amber Rudd gave, and you wanted to ask her a question. Um, what was it, and have you had any answer over the last few hours um, that maybe clear up, clears up your, th your, uh, your query? Well, I didn't get to ask a question, but I was interested to know, uh, it was great to see this, and we've already heard from people with MS who are retirement age, who are absolutely delighted and very relieved to know that they won't have to be reassessed. But we're also concerned about the millions of people of working age who are still stuck in a system that, uh, that is not working for them. Uh, and an example of that, 83% of people with MS who go through that process and appeal the result... Uh, have it overturned. So that's 83%. So it's clearly fundamentally flawed. Wonderful news from the Secretary of State today, but let's fix it for everybody else still stuck in that system. Mm. I mean, how difficult is it for someone to have to keep going through this assessment process, particularly someone with MS? It's really difficult. For a start off, uh, stress makes MS worse. Yeah. And this is incredibly stressful. And as Amber Rudd said today, she spoke to someone who said it's like being on trial, having to prove that you, have, you are affected by the condition that you have. And for MS, it's fluctuating, it's different for everyone, and, and the symptoms are often invisible, pain, fatigue, and too many assessors just don't understand it. And it's not just the quality of the assessment, it's also rules like the 20-metre rule, which means that you don't qualify for help if you can walk a step over that. And that doesn't get me very far outside my house. It certainly doesn't get me to a bus stop or to work or to a shop. Mm. So it's trapping people in their homes. So there's a lot to do to fix it. Some great news from government today, but a lot more to do. Sure. Uh, your specific question, though, that you didn't get to ask Amber Rudd was yes. to do with people who are over 65, was it? So uh, I'm interested to know, and uh, I haven't seen the detail yet, but mm -hmm. for those pensioners who no longer will have to go through the assessments, and that's mm -hmm. great news, mm -hmm. But I, I would like to know how many of them are on the highest level, whether they're all on the highest level right. because if, uh, of, of benefits. Because if you are, say, 65 and mildly affected or moderately affected, and then your condition worsens in five years, right. how do you make sure that you know, your, your uh, support matches your needs? Right. So ironically then, you'd want another assessment? You may want to request another assessment if your needs uh, increase. And right. so I haven't seen the detail of that. Obviously, it was just uh, uh, an announcement today, and the detail will come. Uh, but, but it's that sort of thing that, you know, whilst the clearly extremely good intentions mm -hmm. from government today, we need to make sure that the detail isn't unintentionally 
disadvantaging people. Mm. Um, Amma Rudd tried to make it clear, and, and you told me that you felt that she was sincere, uh, tried to make it clear that the, the, the sort of welfare system and the benefit system should be working for people, yes. um, not working against people. Mm -hmm. uh, that people should feel that they're getting what they need from the system. Is there a sense, has there been a sense, that the system hasn't been working for so many people for, for quite a long time now? Hugely so. Uh, you know, we hear from people all the time that say, having MS is hard enough. It shouldn't be made harder by a, a welfare system that makes no sense to them, that doesn't understand their condition. Um, and uh, assessors who, you know, I, I could tell you so many stories of people who you know, reach over to get a handbag and are told, oh, that means you can cook a you meal. Can do it, yeah. You know, yeah. that sort of thing. And, mm. uh, and so it does need fundamentally fixing. Um, and the idea floated today about putting some of the uh, assessments together, so reducing the number of assessments people have on paper, a great idea. Mm -hmm. But if they're as poor quality uh, as they are currently, then you can do tremendous harm to people's chances of, of getting the support they need. Uh, I, I said earlier it's like putting two donkeys onto a farm court, ca cart and, and expecting a chariot. It's not going to happen. Mm. Sure. Okay, we'll leave it there. Genevieve Edwards from the uh, MS Society. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you.